I'm going to tell, I think I'm going to tell the next the church service that my conversion story. But I'm going to have to jump ahead a little bit. <clears throat> I became born again believer in 1979. And I knew absolutely nothing about any Christian theology. I knew nothing. And as I've said been saying for days now, if you would have said to me that I was a sinner, I, I, I just would have looked at you. You might as well have told me I came from Mars. Because just having been raised in a secular Jewish home, secular environment, that's just not, I wasn't bad. I didn't kill people. You know, I wasn't a dope dealer. So, you know, but anyway, and, and I say that to, um, and just again, to just show you how little I knew about anything. But I remember I had a very powerful, and I guess every conversion is powerful, I'd say dramatic conversion experience. And I mean, I woke up one morning, I was just plain old Cliff, and I went to bed that night a born-again believer in Jesus. And it was amazing because I was 23 and I had almost every single, it was very humiliating to wake up one day and suddenly realize almost everything that I had believed in my life at the most basic level was wrong. I'm not talking third, fourth tier stuff. I'm talking as if my whole life I thought the earth was flat and then I suddenly realized, wow, the earth was round. My whole life I thought two plus two equals five and then I suddenly discovered equals four. I mean, I got zapped and I had a radical worldview change. And yet I remembered there was one area where I felt this irreconcilable, I mean, I was okay. I was able to throw everything out. That's fine. But one area where I, um, I had a struggle, I had been raised and educated on evolution. Just raised, educated on it, taught it. Never was in a situation, I do not remember ever in my life, ever seriously questioning it. I still distinctly remember the fifth grade. And I had a textbook. And I don't know why, I, I memorized, I don't have a particularly good memory. But to this day, I still remember, I memorized the Azoic, Archaeozoic, Protozoic, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic era. I remember sitting in my room and I memorized it. And I also remember in the fifth grade, the text in that same textbook, they had a shallow pool. Then they had a picture right above it of like a one-celled critter. I guess it wouldn't be a one cell. And then a jellyfish. And then a fish. And then some kind of amphibian. And then a reptile. And then some pre-human and then, you know, a Neanderthal and then a homo sapien and they drew a line through it. And that's how I was taught human origins. And again, I never, there's no reason to question it. And then I remember in the ninth grade, Nautilus Junior High School, which was funny, I found out about 10 years ago that most of you know the name Doug Batchelor. Found out 10 years ago that Doug Batchelor and I were in that same junior high school at the same time in Miami Beach, which is astonishing. But that's a whole other story. But I remember in the ninth grade, I thought I was hot stuff because I knew what ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny is. Pretty impressive for a ninth grader. And I used to throw that around. And it's the idea that an embryo, 
If you study an embryo in the womb, the idea is that it goes through the phases of evolution. It's got gills at one point when we were fish. It's got fins when we were something else and so on. And the fact was, this is something that had been concocted by some Darwin acolyte named Ernst Haeckel. And he concocted around the turn of the century and it was debunked almost immediately. Now, to this day, there's question whether he did it on purpose or whether it was just flimsy, but whatever it was, it had been debunked almost after. But here I was in the mid-1960s being taught that, and you still have echoes of it even being taught today. And then I remember I was in college at the University of Florida, and I, I, I remember I had an anthropology class. And... Um, I don't remember, I just remember everything was premised on evolution. Well, anyway, I, as I said, I never gave it a second thought. It's just the way it was. Well, I wake up one day, I'm a born-again Christian. And again, I don't know anything. As I said, I didn't even know I was a sinner. But I sensed a clash. I sensed at the most gut level that, hey, this can't work, that they both can't be right. And I didn't know what to do. So there were these people who I had met, and I met in the health food store, and I'll tell that later. And I was going to them like, you know, what about evolution? And they were just laughing it off. Well, I just couldn't do that. And I guess I bugged them long enough. And they finally they gave me some creationist book to read. And I have no, I don't even remember what it was. I have no idea if it was any good. I think a lot of creationist literature could be as speculative and wacko as the, quote, bona fide evolutionary stuff. I don't remember, but I do remember it was a life changer for me. Because this is what happened. I... Nobody denies you got fossils in the ground, okay? The fossils are there, okay? But what happened was I was 23 years old, right before my 24th birthday. And what happened was suddenly for the first time in my life, I was presented with the, with the fact that there were other options, other ways to explain how they got there, okay? In other words, all I had told my whole life, billions of years of evolution and so on and so forth, and, and suddenly I'm showed, hey, no, there are other ways to interpret things, and all these other things that I had been, the, the, the butterfly supposedly that got changed with the change in the environment, and all this stuff that I had always been taught my whole life was proof of evolution, I suddenly was presented with, hey, the facts are there, okay? The stuff is there. But, you know, there's other ways to look at it. And I was just blown away because it had never entered my mind. And, you know, partly I was somewhat angry. I wasn't angry that I had been taught evolution. I was angry that I had been taught it in such a dogmatic manner where I was, you never entertained the idea that there was anything else. And it was quite an eye-opener for me. And little did I know, little did I know that what I experienced there was a, something that in the philosophy of science is called the underdetermination of theory by evidence. Now that's kind of a fancy term, but let me give you an, let me try to explain this a little bit. And the, basically, the idea is 
you can have some evidence. You can have a phenomena, something happen. And you can have all sorts of different explanations for it. All sorts of theories that could describe and predict the phenomena. Okay, the theories all say this, and they can be blatantly opposite, contradictory theories. And yet, at the same time, they describe the phenomena. In other words, you could have the phenomena, and you could have, you know, ideally, in fact, there was a philosopher of science, very respected philosopher of science in the 20th century. His name was Karl Popper. And you know what Popper said? He said, you know what, the, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the chances of you ever absolutely proving your theory correct? And Popper said, the chances of you ever proving it correct said are zero. That's not the same as saying that your theory is correct. But he's arguing that your chances, the certainty of knowing absolutely, it's zero. Because whatever theory you have, eventually somebody could come along later and replace it with something else that's better. And if you studied the history of science all through the years, there were scientific theories that people were absolutely certain of and absolutely sure of and made predictions and this and that that eventually got replaced. Now, the interesting thing is I'm not totally sure I buy into Popper, okay? I think there's some truth to it, but it's not as clear-cut and easy as he said. And the reason I bring that up is because we live in a day and age, and I've been saying this all week, and poor Sven's been having to hear me repeat the same dog and pony show. You have that phrase here? Dog and Pony Show? Is that Australian? Dog and Pony Show? Oh, no. <laughs> that's a, that's a, you can guess what it is. But anyway, you know, every age, we look back at the ludicrous myths that different ages people believed. Okay? We look back, some of the stuff is the silliest stuff. And yet we, what, you think we're... It's now so sophisticated that we're the only age that doesn't believe in myths. And I think if time should last 500 years, heaven forbid, they would advance. They would look back and they'd laugh at us the way we laugh at some of the things people believe years ago. But you say, but no, we don't believe in myths anymore. We believe in science and science gives you the truth. But hey, folks, that's the great myth of our time. It's that, well, it's science. It's got to be true. Have you ever been in a situation, you get in a debate with someone, and they say, but it's science. You know what I'm saying? But it's science. And then what is the, the implication of that? You have to bow down and genuflect before it because that's the Absolute epistemic king. That's the king of how you learn truth, how you understand what reality is. It's science. And that's a very powerful myth. It's very powerful. And one of the reasons it's so powerful is that the science works. Okay? Scientific theories oftentimes work. But you know, one of the things I discovered years ago, the fact that a scientific theory works is completely separate issue from whether it happens to be true or not. In fact, some popper would say the fact that it works is totally irrelevant. You could, I said, I could come up with all sorts of other theories to explain the phenomena to make it work. Let me give you an example. Because that blows people's minds sometimes. In fact, I even, I might as well just start plugging it now. <laughs> I wrote a book based on, on some of this called Baptizing the Devil. 
evolution and the seduction of Christianity. Okay, if you're, I mean, ever, I spent five years researching, reading philosophy of science, and then writing the book. And one of the things is you, re, you got all sorts of examples. Well, let me give you an example. Instead of just describing it, for centuries, if you wanted to sail your boat from, say, Lisbon, Portugal, to Rome, you could sail your boat following the stars, okay? Or you could, if you wanted to predict where Venus was going to be in the sky in six months, you could do it based on a whole scientific theory that had the earth sitting immobile, wrong, in the center of the universe, wrong, orbited by all the planets and stars, wrong, orbited in perfect, perfect circles, wrong, orbiting at constant speeds, wrong. In other words, every single thing about that theory, which lasted for 1,800 years or longer than that, every single thing about the theory was wrong. But guess what, folks? It worked. It worked. You were able to get technology. You were able to make predictions from it. And this is one of the reasons why Karl Popper argued predictions are cheap. Theories that work, it's totally irrelevant from whether they happen to be true or not. And I think that's important because sometimes we're, we're kowtowed. We're kowtowed by the fact, well, the theories work. Okay, fine, they work. In fact, there's, but that is a total separate issue from whether they're true or not. In fact, I have a chapter in the book by a famous philosopher of science. And he said a theory could be good but not true. And that's a mind, that was a mind blower to me. Because you tend to think, what good is a false theory? Well, it could be plenty good if it helps you make predictions. In fact, I am um, part of the inspiration I got for this. I had list, I listened to stuff called the Teaching Company, called the Great Courses, and they go around the United. I've got probably twenty two hundred lectures on my iPhone, and they go around the country getting the best college professors in America. And they left on they lecture on history, philosophy, science. And I got a, theories of, a, a, a series of 36 lectures by a professor. Basically, it's called, it's called the Science Wars. It was a life changer for me. And it was just the, the history of the philosophy of science. And the guy was an evolutionist. He might have even been an atheist. I don't know. He was an Orthodox Jew. He had a cap on his head. The kippah, they call it, so, but he, that doesn't necessarily mean he even believed in God, okay? But I know he was an evolutionist. But it, 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 it was, I got inspired to write the book because of the series of lectures from him. Obviously, he's not an ev creationist, and he'd be appalled by some of the stuff in here, but that's a separate issue. But one of the things he taught, he said it was fascinating. He said, by the turn of the 20th century, when they went from the 19th to the 20th century, almost every scientific theory that had been believed, promulgated, promoted, used, by the beginning of the 20th century, every last one of them had been overturned. Every last one, he said, had been overturned. And he said, what makes us think by the end of the 21st century or in the 20th, that some of the theories we have now will survive. And yet the interesting thing was, he, by the, but the early type of the 20th century, they were saying to some of these industrialists, hey, you know, by the way, 
by the way, that the science that you use to build your widget, the theory that you use, we no longer believe that theory. We no longer believe it anymore. Well, the guy says, I could care less. What do I care whether it's, all I know is it works and I build my widget and I build it for $5 and I sell it for 25. I don't care what the theory is. In fact, by the middle of the 18th century, the middle of the 19th, 18th century, there were people, or no, 19th century, I always get that confused. There, was a, there were people, there was a guy named Fourier, and he wrote some books, some stuff about heat. You know, back then, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, back then they still were questioning what heat was. What was heat? What caused it? They had what they call the phalostian. Is that how you pronounce it? Phalostian theory of heat. And it was the idea when you heated something, this chemical, this phalostian came out of it and so on because they didn't know. And at one point, Fourier, he said, look, who cares what heat is? That's not a scientific question. That's a metaphysical question. All we want to know what it does. All we want to know is how to interpret, you know, how do we make predictions from it? How do we use it? All the rest of that's, that's metaphysics. That's got nothing to do with science. And in fact, to this day, there's a vast divide among philosophers of science, whether they think science is even some say science has got nothing to do with pursuing truth, okay? Science is all about making predictions about how the world acts. Or some would say it doesn't even go that far. All science could do is make predictions about how the world appears to us. Because how the world appears to us could be radically different from how the world really is. Let me give you a real quick example. Let me give you a quick example here. I, let's, nobody talk for a moment. Silence. Now, Competitive arrangements. On the other hand, one can you hear this? Competitive arrangements, and so to me at least, it's a very uh, fact-intensive. Did this stuff? This stuff didn't originate in my cell phone. This stuff didn't. Where is this noise? It's in the air, all around us. It's as real as that. It's as real as my book. It's as real as me. And yet, our senses, our senses, absolutely cannot pick it up. So how subjective, how limited our senses are. And some say, well, science can't tell us about the real world because we can't even know about the real world. All science could do is just tell us how it appears to us in our senses. Now, again, I'm not totally... I, when I was working on this book, I gave the manuscript as I was working to a friend of mine who's a psychologist... Whoops. See, there's more out in reality out there. Yeah. And I asked him to read it. Come on. Okay. And I wanted, I, you know, I wanted a couple of scientists to read the book because I didn't really do much any science in here. I'm looking at the philosophy of science. And I gave it to a friend of mine who was a psychologist. And he came back, and any time I had written anything at all about science as a pursuit of truth, he marked it in red. And he said to me, he said, any honest scientist will tell you that science has got nothing to do with pursuing truth. Now, again, I'm still not sure I buy that, okay? I, you know, I'm not sure, but my friend happened to have been a psychologist, and sometimes I, you know, there's a joke, all true science is physics, everything else is stamp collecting. And I said, well, Bobby, you know, you're a soft scientist. And he agreed. So what do you think a physicist would say? And he'd say, well, a physicist would say 
Science is all about finding laws. Finding laws. Okay. You know, I wish I had a blackboard here, but just ever, but even finding laws, though. What's the most famous scientific formula we have all know about? E equals mc squared. Okay? It's powerful. You could, ideally, it's matter and energy conversion. If you had a raisin and you could convert that into energy, you could power Sydney for a couple days from a raisin. Why? What does, e ex what does it explain? E equals mc squared. It explains absolutely nothing. It describes. It describes what could happen. But why? Why does energy equal mass times the speed of light squared? I don't know. I don't know if you have, and, and any explanation you get, somebody else could have other explanations, and you go on. And then whatever you explain it as, Okay, well, why that? And then you can explain it, well, well, because of that. Well, why that? Because of that. And ultimately, you just keep going, and sooner or later, all your explanations stop. Now, again, the reason I'm bringing all this up, and I deal with a lot of this in the book, is because let me, let me, let me lay it out as I see it for whatever it's worth. If, if the vast majority of some of the world's smartest people, the vast majority of the world's experts, the greatest experts in physics, in biology, in chemistry, in paleontology, and, and all that, the, the Nobel laureates, the PhDs, the postdocs, if the vast majority of them, if they're right, then I would say everything we believe as Christians is a bunch of hooey. Okay? You can I, I do not believe that you can any possible way, being any honesty at all with the scripture, fit evolution in with the scripture. And what I deal with the book is I deal with a hunk of the part of the back of the book. I look at examples of Christians. See, unfortunately, Christianity, Christians have been notorious compromisers. How do you think we got Sunday keeping? Christians compromise. How do you think we got the whole medieval, medieval apostasy? Christians compromise. Why did the General Conference up until the 1950s have a segregated cafeteria where they didn't let blacks eat in the same room as the whites? Christians compromising. And we live compromising with culture. Culture. All through history, culture has seemed to dominate the church and leads the Christians around by their nose. And our culture is dominated by science. That's our culture. And it's amazing to me how many Christians, almost the whole evangelical world, has now made its peace with evolution. Almost the whole evangelical, the liberal churches, they, they were some of the first ones to accept it. And yet I'm sorry. If evolution is true, everything we believe falls apart. And let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of just what, well, right, before I do that, now that might bother you a little. Wow, the smartest people, the experts, you're saying they got it all wrong, the experts? Well, let's look at a parallel. Most of us here, I assume, are Seventh-day Adventists. So I assume if there's any one doctrine that I think we got down, okay, I think we, most of us would agree we're right. Without being too dogmatic, but the evidence is the Seventh-day Sabbath. 
I mean, come on. How much more, you know, the Christians will talk about sin and they'll talk about the law and then suddenly, you know, the importance of the law and then the moment you get to the seventh day Sabbath, it's a bunch of hokey, all different stuff they try to do to get around it, okay? So you're pretty sure about that, huh? Well, why is it that the vast majority, some of the world's greatest, the vast majority of the world's greatest Bible scholars, the experts in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Ugaritic, the experts in Old Testament history, the experts in New Testament history, the experts in church history, the experts in systematic theology, why is it that the vast majority, the smartest people, the, 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 the Nobel, I don't have to give them Nobel prizes for that, but by far the greatest theologians, the greatest thinkers, the vast, vast majority of them get it wrong. So I'm not too worried about the vast majority, especially when you study the history of science you realize all through history the vast majority had it wrong over and over again. But let me give you an example. Let me give you an example here from Australia of what happens, what, what happens to Christians when they buy into the myth of our era. And the great myth of our era is science is the truth. Science leads to the truth. Scientific truth is somehow this higher level of truth and everything needs to surrender to it. A couple years ago, Desmond Ford sent me a book he wrote called Genesis versus Darwin. And at first I thought, well, you know, I had heard rumors that Desmond Ford abandoned creation, but a title like that. But as I got in the book, I realized, no, he did abandon creation. He, he calls himself a progressive creationist, which is just another, it's a more theistic evolution. But every now and then, God jumps in and tweaks things. But it's still billions of years of the whole evolutionary model. And Ford says, look, we have to accept this. We are in an era dominated, it's exact words verbatim. We're in an era dominated by modern science. That's his exact words. And the myth is, well, because it's dominated by science, science is the true way, science leads to truth, science teaches billions of years of evolution and the mass extinct, and on and on and on. Therefore, we're, we're, we're in danger of becoming irrelevant, Whatever, if we don't accept it, okay? He just bought the Kool-Aid. Now, Desmond Ford understands, though, one of the problems. Dr. Ford was always very, and he's right on this. I have no problem with this. Strong on the gospel. Strong on Christ's substitutionary atonement. But he realizes that in most any theistic evolutionary model, you have a real problem with that. Because where do you get a sinless Adam in an evolutionary model? Okay, Where do you get a sinless being? There was no death, a perfect flawless being, because all the way, six times in the book of in Romans 5, You've got Adam, Christ, Adam, Christ. Adam messed up, Christ came to fix it. Adam fell, Christ fixed it. Adam brought death, Christ brought life. Six times in that one chapter, you go to Corinthians. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus came to undo. And Desmond Ford is very clear. He says, in many ways, the whole gospel stands or falls on a literal Adam. But how do you get a literal Adam? I read something a while back where another theistic evolutionist said, look, forget about Adam. Forget about it. There's no such thing as a sinless Adam. You just cannot have it. 
okay? He was being a little more honest, I think, with reality. So Desmond Ford wants to try to find a way to get a sinless Adam into the Scripture. So I'm not kidding you. You'd have to read the book yourself. I deal with it in here. Desmond Ford argues that the Adam of Genesis 1 through 324, the Adam that appears in those first three chapters, is a completely different Adam separated by a hundred thousand years from the Adam in the very next verse, Genesis 4, 1. And what do you know? And he's forced to even admit what a coincidence that this Adam in Genesis 4, 1, completely different Adam, separated by a hundred thousand years, what a coincidence, also just happens to have a wife named Eve. Now, do you laugh or do you cry? How would a man who, by his own light, spent 75 years studying the Bible come up with such, we have a Yiddish word for this, mishigas, mishigas, grandma's tales. How does he come up? Well, he's forced to because he's accepted the great myth of our time. It's science. The scientific evidence shows it. We can't go against the science. The evidence is overwhelming. Therefore, there had to have been millions of years, and therefore, we've got to bend the Scripture to fit the science. And I'm telling you, as ludicrous as that is, that's not half as dumb as some of the other things in here. Of what, and see, the funny thing is, there's a lot of atheistic evolutionists They're very, they mock, they mock the theistic evolutionists. They mock, oh, they're trying to fit this into the Bible. They're trying to fit this in with a loving God and on and on and on. And I appreciate their candor. They, I think, are being more honest than the theistic evolutionists. But anyway, you know, the bottom line, look, if evolution is true, what do you do, okay, No sinless Adam, no Eve, no fall. Makes it very problematic. You know, what do you do with, um, think about it too, the resurrection of the dead. Who did Jesus die for? Why did Jesus die on the cross? What happened at the cross? Jesus died to, to redeem, you know, advanced monkeys. And then what do you do with the resurrection of the dead? You read scripture, it's very clear in the blink, in the twinkling of an eye, dead are going to be resurrected. So what do you do with someone who 2,000 years ago, got body got tossed in the Aegean Sea and were eaten by squids, okay? And yet there's going to be an instantaneous resurrection? Or is God going to use billions of years of the Darwinian model, you know, to recreate humanity. Again, he's going to recreate a new heavens and recreate the new earth. Is he going to use billions of years? You know, and you can go on and on and on, point after point after point. Evolution destroys it. So I wrote this. As I said, I wrote this book. I wrote it for any conservative Christian. Take Scripture seriously but it struggles with the propaganda onslaught because it's, it's, it's relentless. You know, it's not even, it's, it's assumed. Everything just assumes evolution. You know, and I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating for myself to find myself in a culture, in a culture where I think some of the founding myths or whatever I disagree with, and it's, 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 it's very fascinating to me to just, to, to just look at that and just see, because see, I spent a lot of time studying this stuff, 
So I can understand the, 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 the um, well, let me ask, listen, how much more time do we have? I want to, let's leave this open. This is supposed to be Sabbath school. Oh, yeah, right? This is supposed to be, let's, you tell me when to stop. But let's have some questions. Okay, let's do that, because I could sit up here and go on and on and on. But I realize this is supposed to be, a, this doesn't feel like Sabbath school at this time. But yeah, yeah, if you got any questions on this, let her rip. Let them rip. And if you think I'm wrong, let me know. If you, you want to challenge me on something, I, you know, I'm used to just doing this in front of people that basically agree with me. It would be fun sometime to sit there and do this among people who don't. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, okay, day, go Lincoln. ahead. My name is Joe, and um, just sitting here listening to you, um, you sort of, there's a lot of time in people and scientists, whatever, trying to prove something that we know in the Bible that already exists. So perhaps we are, you know, as a Christian, we know what the truth is, and it explains it quite vividly. So all these resources are simply because people don't want to um, believe in something that they can't see. Sure. And um, I just read something down. It just says... Would you have a question? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't really have a question. It's just like a view on it. Good. And I've just been... That science is a truth question, Mark. And perhaps it should be that religion is a truth and science gives us glimpses of the truth. Yeah. Well, see, yeah, that's good. That's good. See, as I said, I'm not, I do think science does give you glimpses of reality. It gives you glimpses of the real world. I take it funny because I'm attacked. Somebody, I wrote an article on the review. I have an online column in the Avenus Review. If you're ever interested in this, you go to the Avenus Review and just search Cliff's Edge. And I got a lot of columns on this. And somebody wrote something about my last one. Well, you got Goldstein on his anti-science thing again. Uh-uh. Being against evolution no more makes me anti-science than being against praying to statues of Mary makes me anti the virgin birth or anti the incarnation. Really, what I'm really against is scientism. That's the myth. The idea that if it's science, it's got to be true, and we need to surrender all our views to it, even religious views to it. And I just flat out disagree. Yes, sir, go ahead. Hey. So um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, but it also says in Job and in Hebrews that God created the worlds. So was the universe here... Uh, and this is a theological sure. question. Is the universe older than the Earth? Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, you know what I'm yeah. saying. Well, I, it, look, I believe that. See, I, someone said about the Big Bang. I don't have any problem with the Big Bang. Someone said, God said, bang, <laughs> and here it is. And, you know, the Big Bang, you go back, there's an awful lot of math, an awful lot of physics, an awful lot in Big Bang cosmogony. And where did it all come from? I have absolutely no problem. People say, you believe in the Big Bang? Yeah, it's probably wrong, but I don't have a problem with the Big Bang. If you were to ask me what I believe, for whatever it's worth, I have no problem God created the universe jillions of years ago. Okay? And when I read Genesis 1, Genesis 1, one, one, and two. There's something here. And the earth was tohu vabohu, you know, without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was something here, tohu vabohu, okay, without form and void. And then you get the sequence. God said, let there be, and there was. God said, let there be and there was. Day one, let there be and there was. You got this very rhythmic sequence of the six days of creating here on earth, life and so forth, that you don't have in those first few verses. So I, if you were to ask me, I think a long time ago, God created, there was some mass here, something here without form and void. Now, I could be wrong, 
I could be wrong. I do believe the universe existed before, and I think you got biblical evidence for that. You know, the sons of God shouted, shouted for joy in the creation and so on. You've got biblical evidence for that. So, so I believe that there was probably something here, and then in six literal 24-hour days, God created the world, and then he rested on the seventh day. And, you know, this brings up a question then. I want to touch on, I meant to touch on it. Why did science, which gets so much right, why did it get so much, why did it get origin so wrong? Okay. And <coughs> I believe it stems, I believe it stems from two, uh, two fundamental principles Two fundamental principles of science that science has to work from, and yet both are wrong when it comes to origins. Okay? I'm getting on a big old airplane tomorrow. I'm not, believe me, I'm ready to go home, too. He's been working me. They've been working me like a dog since I got here. They've been working. They start working me like a dog at Coffs Harbor, working me like a dog at Brisbane, and you know, I'm going to go home and go to work so I could relax. <laughs> but uh, let me explain. That. Then I'll get to your question, but because I want to touch on this, why does science get it wrong? I'm going to fly on a plane. Now that plane was built maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, based on laws of aerodynamics. Now, I sure hope that when I'm 30,000 feet over the Pacific, that those laws of thermodynamics that were in play 20, 25 years ago, 15 years ago when they built that jet, I'm hoping those laws are still in play when I'm flying. And you see, you can't do science. You really probably couldn't do anything if there's not this constancy of the laws of nature. Okay, so science works on this principle, the constancy of the laws of nature. It's very good, and it makes a lot of sense. The only problem is, is when it comes to origins, it's completely wrong. God created a world. There was no death. How radically, how, we can't even imagine. How can we imagine a world where there was no death, no human death, okay, no animal death, that never rained? before the flood. How vastly different was the ecosystem than from today? And then even after the flood, people lived 900 years. Okay, you see the point here? It, but yet, if it's going to say, hey, only the way things are now, and they have to extrapolate back, extrapolate back, whatever they're going to come, if they rule out that it was different, they're going to get it wrong. The other thing that science works on, and it has to, and I'm glad, is that you can't use supernatural explanations for natural causes. If I go to the doctor sick, I don't want him evoking deities or de de imps or demons. If I'm sick, I want him to know, hey, what am I eating? Am I eating, drinking too much lager? Am I eating too much fat back? Okay, too much pork, too much lot, whatever. I want, in other words, I want them to get a natural explanation. Okay, great, I'll take it, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I want a natural explanation for natural causes. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah. I'll take it, yeah. I'll take it. Organic lamb juice. You pour the water. Oh, what is that? Oh, it's lemon juice? Organic lamb juice. Lamb juice? It's okay? Oh, lime. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, you need natural explanations. But you got to read Genesis. Everything about it was supernatural. 
But if it's, it's like I've used this example, if he commits murder, he commits a murder, and yet I'm the detective, and I rule him out, say, ah, uh, he didn't do it, then inevitably, whomever I arrest for the murder is what? I got it wrong. Okay, and if science rules out the supernatural, then whatever explanation it's going to give for creation has to be wrong. So between the constancy of nature, which is a brilliant principle, it has to work that way. It's wrong at origins, and by rejecting the supernatural, it's wrong at origins as well. So we get this nonsense story and you know, and you read the, the stuff. It's well, anyway. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, Clifford. Um, it's interesting you mentioned about sequence and also death. And I'm thinking about the science of DNA. Okay. The Bible actually said, "Before I form you, I know you," which actually suggests to me that our intelligent designer knows me even before he actually formed my DNA. And it suggests to me that there was or there is an intelligent designer, otherwise I wouldn't be here asking the question. Um, has there been any science regarding that? Because to me, the science of DNA basically support that, you know, God is. Yeah. Well, yeah, the DNA is just, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable, the information in there. But, you know, you touch on something, and again, I can't talk, get, talk to that because I don't know. I purposely... When I deal with this, I'm trying to avoid getting into the science itself. I'm just looking at the principles behind how it's done because I just don't have the background for that. I don't want to get into these debates because I'm just not qualified for it. I admit that. I don't have a problem with that. But what I want to look at is what are their assumptions? What are their presuppositions? What are they doing? In fact, there's a, this guy, Popper. I have a chapter in my book called Science in a Swamp. And this guy, Karl Popper, used the image of science is built on a swamp. In other words, it's never, ever on an absolutely firm foundation. Okay? Now, you can build a swamp. You can put pilings in it. And you can build a structure. You can build an F edifice. And you could have a whole system, you could have technology, you can make predictions, you could create medicines, you could do all this stuff based on something, but even if at the core it might still be wrong. Okay, now the reason I bring this up is we want a two edged, we gotta be kids, a two edged sword. Because a lot of times I hear Christians say, well, science here confirms my faith. Science, now, first of all, when you say that, what are you, what are you assuming? You're assuming, well, science, science is science. And science is such a good way to learn truth. Therefore, science confirms my faith. Therefore, you know, there's, there's more proof for my faith. Well, but maybe the science that's confirming it is wrong. Maybe five years from now, ten years from now, they're going to say that whole thing that you had to affirm your faith has now been thrown out. So what happens to your faith? So we've got to be careful with that. I mean, I agree in some ways. I think some of the, I, everything I've ever learned about biology or the human, everything, it's just science has taught, helps affirm it for me. But I'm very careful with that because it can be a two-edged sword as well. Let me give you another example very quick. Then how much more time do we have before we... All uh, right, yeah, I still got to preach a sermon. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All righty. Well, let me, instead of me waxing eloquent here, does somebody else have a... I have, I have a question. I'll make it the last Okay, one. go ahead. My question is, in Genesis, there is a lot of science. I mean, if you look at the account of creation from a scientific perspective, there's a lot of scientific truth in the sequence of events and, and how it all came about. How do we reconcile the science of the Bible with religion and faith? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by, you would say, the science in there. 
What has God said? Let there the land come bring forth trees after their own kind. God speaks the trees into existence, each bearing their own fruit. Where does, how does science even begin? Even begin to approach that. See what I'm saying? How does it even begin? God said, let the, you know, the land come bring forth you know, the, the animals. And God speaks them into existence. God breathes, creates Adam out of the dust of the ground, takes Eve out of the side. I mean, I don't think science can even begin. You see what I'm saying? Even begin to touch it. I mean, science is good for a lot of things. Okay, I, I, There's no question about that, but when you get... To something like that, I just think it's way out of its depth. It's just, it, it's, you're using the wrong tools. It's almost like you got your PC, you want to fix your PC, you bring a chainsaw and a hammer in. 